or two. I haven't taught on something like this in a while. Sometimes it's good to go back. Because what happens a lot of the time is, I know what happens with me, is uh, you have a lot of people out here teaching a lot of error under this banner right here. Rightly dividing, right? Is this thing going to work today? What you do? What'd you do, Russell? <laughs> but they teach a lot of wrong stuff. In fact, you got a famous one up in Connecticut named Rodney, drug a, drug a bunch of people in through this phrase right here, rightly dividing the word of truth, and now he's teaching universalism, right? You got, you got people out here that claim to be right dividers, and then when you teach on biblical sanctification, they're ready to chop your head off. Yep. Yep. And so what happens a lot of the time is we get so aggravated with people who teach, who, who use this, this stuff wrongly that we kind of just like, we kind of get tired of all of it. This is a biblical command. Amen? Paul wrote this. This is not a church epistle. Second Timothy is not a church epistle. It is not written for babies in Christ. It is written to a man that he tells in chapter 3, you have fully known my doctrine. This is a man, this is a personal epistle written to a man that had been faithful to Paul throughout his entire life. When, Paul, when Apollos didn't want to go to Corinth, who went? Who did he send to Philippi and say, I have no other man so like-minded who will naturally care for your state. Amen? Amen. The man was so, the, this young man was so faithful that he got the last book Paul ever wrote. And it's written to him prior to his death to exhort and instruct him on carrying on the ministry of God's word that had been committed through Paul, the apostle and prisoner of Jesus Christ. There had been something committed to this earth through the apostleship and the prisoner of Jesus Christ, Paul. And he's telling Timothy, you hold it fast, you keep it. You faithfully exercise it in season and out of season, Timothy. This book contains well over 30 commands, warnings, and instructions to the man of God. 30 of them. Over 30 of them. Four chapters. Tells him what to shun, what to turn away from, what to look for, this know, this know, knowing this. 30 commands, warnings, and instructions to the man of God and allows, and, and what, what it does what Paul does in this epistle is he follows a pattern of personal instruction for the purpose of outward communication. In other words, you know where the ministry of the Word of God begins? With you personally. And until you get some personal conviction about that book, and you've been personally convinced about the truth of that book in yourself, keep your mouth shut. And I say that with all charity in my heart that I can possibly muster. They will be like, oh, he told me to shut up. Exactly. Learn to rightly divide swift to hear and slow to speak before you start worrying, worrying, worrying about big boy stuff. Amen. Amen. I didn't get where I'm at because I was always running my mouth. I got where, I, where I'm at because I kept my mouth shut and shut the door to a Bible study and sat and wept and studied and read my Bible with an honest heart. And Paul's telling Timothy here, there's personal instruction. Like, for example, in chapter 1 when he says this, he says this right here, he says, he says, Timothy, be not ashamed of the testimony, nor of me, his prisoner, but be partaker of the afflictions. Hold fast. Keep the things that was committed to your trust. Then commit these things to other faithful men. See how it went from personal 
to outward communication. Right here, he's going to talk about studying. Studying to show yourself approved unto God. Purging yourself. In verse 21, if a man purge himself from these, then he gets into the communication of that. That once you, once you study, once you've purged yourself from the errors of man, then you can instruct those that oppose themselves. That you may recover them out of the snare of the devil. We're going to look what the snare of the devil is. In chapter 3, he says, Timothy, things are going to get worse and worse. The world's going to degrade and decline around you, but you continue in the things which you've learned and been assured of. And then preach it in season and out of season. For the time will come when they will not endure it. What do you do? Just keep preaching. Amen. And so these commands are they're following a pattern of personal instruction to outward communication. Now you see this verse right here. Four things in this passage. There's the command right there. Study. There's the motive. What's your motive in reading that Bible? What's your motive in studying that Bible? Is it to belong to a camp? A denomination? Or is it to show yourself personally approved unto God and not worry about anybody else? That's personal. Amen? There's, what you're, there's the purpose of that study. What are you showing yourself approved unto God for? A workman. A man approved by God for a work that he wants you to do. And there's the skill that approves you to God. What do you have to show God? What do you have to show unto God that approves you unto him as a workman? That you are a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. So there's four things in the passage. A command, a motive, a purpose, and a skill. What's it all built upon? Listen, there's not a man in this world that can possibly approve himself unto God if he don't have the word of truth. You know what the first step is in dealing with that book? You've got to have a personal conviction to that book. If you think all you have is a reliable translation, just go to the house. Go fishing. What are we to study, guys? The whole, the whole passage is built on this context right here. We are to study the word of truth in order to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that have developed the skill, I wish that thing would knock it off, rightly dividing the word of truth. So, so what, are we, what, are we, what are we doing here? We're talking about what is the skill that approves us unto God? This rightly dividing. How do you get it? Studying the Bible with the right motive. Amen? You don't, you don't develop this skill. Listen, guys, there are all kinds of men that learned a little, they learned a little bit of right division off of YouTube and think they're, they're God's gift to the world now as workmen. And they're out here making error after error after error after error. Because they haven't personally showed themselves approved unto God, workmen that have developed this skill through studying the Bible the correct way. People say this is the only verse in the Bible that tells you what to do and how to do it. It doesn't tell you how to do it. That, that, listen, if you think that verse is telling you how to study the Bible, that you've got to study it rightly divided, how do you rightly divide it then? Rightly, rightly dividing is the skill that is acquired through study. Amen? That's what the verse is telling you. Now here's the contrast. You see the word but there? So in contrast to this right here, what's he tell Timothy to do? Shun profane and vain babblings. What's that? That's anybody handling the Bible don't know what they're doing. 
That's anybody handling the Bible that doesn't have this skill. They're all around you. You know how I know they're all around you? Because Paul said they will what? Amen. You know what you do? Oh, I'm just going to go to church. You know what that Bible says? The simple believeth what? There you go. Wise man looketh well to his going. Tell you something about a wise man. He's not prejudiced and he's not simple. What I mean by that is a wise man doesn't have his mind made up before he hears the matter. But a wise man also won't believe everything you tell him. So he's listening, he's open, he'll consider, he'll meditate, he'll prove, he'll judge, and approve the things that are excellent. Amen? Shun profane and vain babblings. Two things about these profane and vain babblings. Number one, they will increase. What do they produce? Ungodliness. It marvels, I marvel at the fact that you still have millions and millions of Romans, Roman Catholics when all that church ever produces a bunch of pedophiles. Yeah. Blows my mind. What's your religion producing? And if that's what it's producing, that's what you got. A bunch of profane and vain babblers. Amen? What will, their, what will these profane and vain babblers do? They'll eat a stuff a canker. You know what a canker is? It's like an ulcer on the skin. It's gangrene. You know what it causes? It causes death to fleshly tissue because of a lack of blood. You know what these men do? They devour, they devour, just like that canker does. By the time these, this increase in these profane and vain babblings means that by the time you get done, it's hard to find Bible truth anywhere. Amen? And you got the little people sitting in the church. Well, my pastor said... And I believe Baptists are the closest to the truth and my church, my church, my church. Paul gives you an example of these men of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus who concerning what? Remember what we're dealing with? Concerning the truth, right there's the truth, the resurrection, but concerning this truth, they varied. How? Saying it's past already. You know what they did? They took a Bible truth and made an error concerning it, and look what it did. Overthrew the faith of some. Hey Amen. Y'all with me? That's the contrast between these guys. There's guys that are approved of God for this work. And the rest are just a bunch of profane, vain babblers making error after error after error with that book. Amen? Nevertheless, in spite of it all, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. There are saved people throughout every one of those systems of religion. God knows every one of them. There are people that have been taken captive into these systems. They're in them. They're ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth, but they're saved. And God knows every one of them. But look at what else he says here. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart what? What's iniquity in the context? Right there. You know what iniquity is in that context? You know what you're supposed to depart? You know what everyone that names the name of Christ is to depart? The profane and vain babblings of a bunch of religious men who's running their mouth and don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> don't get mad at me. Would it make you feel better if I called you a babbler instead of telling you Sit down, shut up, quit running your mouth when you don't know what you're doing. Can I call you a babbler? Would that be better? 
What if I called you a profane and vain babbler? See, it's pe people don't like the Bible. They really don't like the Bible. It's why they've rewritten it 200 times. Could you imagine if we tried to rewrite Moby Dick? How upset people would get if we took the works of Shakespeare and said, we're going to make them easier to understand. You know why people do that? Because they don't like the Bible. Amen, guys. You got this stuff all around, and if you name the name of Christ, you know what you're supposed to do? Depart it. Come out from, what is it Paul said over there? They have a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. From such, withdraw thyself. You're not supposed to be playing fellowship with this stuff. Amen. What's he telling? In a great house, there are not. Now, this, listen, man, this is what you've got to understand. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of earth, but also of wood, or gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, some to dishonor. If, see that right there? Remember, what are, we, what are we talking about? We're talking about approving ourselves. If a man, there's a condition. If a man therefore purge himself from these. What's the these? These things right here. You know how many errors there are in Christianity? Huh? What do you have to do to be a vessel unto honor and meet suitable for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. What do you got to do? You got to purge yourself from that. How? I was raised a Baptist. I was raised a Baptist. You know what, you know what happened in my life? There come a time when I was more scared of my ignorance than not being a Baptist. Mm-hmm. I was more scared of God than I was 40 Baptist preachers. That's the hard it's going to take to learn that book. Amen? What is it going to be if a man purge himself from these? There's a requirement, guys. There's a requirement for you to be a vessel of honor unto God. A man prepared, and it doesn't matter how long you've went to school or how much Greek and Hebrew you know. How many pieces of paper you got from a man. What approves you unto God, first off, personal conviction that you've got the word of truth and then study it with the right motive. <clears throat> and then let that book purge you from all the errors of the profane and vain babblers in the world. <clears throat> That's personal. Now you want to know how you do that? How are you going to purge yourself from that stuff? Right there. You see, that's personal. <clears throat> what is it preparing you for, this work right here? Servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that what? What does it mean to oppose themselves? It means they're in opposition to you. We call it Christian. Guys, you know your biggest enemies in this world are Seventh-day Adventists, JWs, Mormons, Catholics, Baptists, Presbyterians, Episcopalians, Methodists. Those people are in opposition. Just because they carry a Bible and go to church every Sunday don't mean they're not in opposition to the truth. Amen. I've never had a drunk make a video about me. I've never had a heroin addict get up and be like, uh, Paul's a heretic. <clears throat> oh instructing those that oppose themselves, what do we do? After we purge ourselves, we instruct those that are in opposition. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of what? The truth. There it is again. Because where are they at? They're in a system that has erred concerning the truth. And what do we do? We instruct them that God may give them 
this repentance to the acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So you know what the snare of the devil is today? Religious systems that err concerning the truth. How's that? How's that sound? You're going to go home and say, so-and-so started going to church, and it's a church of God, but I'm just glad he's going somewhere. Is that going to be your attitude from now on? Now that you understand, you know what that is? You see that word snare? It's just like, it's just like trying to cast a, put a gill net out in the lake or Throw a, throw a line out in the water or set a, set a fall trap or a snare wire for an animal. It means religion is the devil's trap to take captives. You getting it? How do they do it? Well, they creep in the houses <laughs> and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with diverse lusts. You ever wondered why they're trying to destroy the male in America? Yeah. Hmm? Glorifying, glorifying the feminine? Destroying the masculine? Who'd the devil go after? Sorry, ladies. See this right here? This is where it's, now I'm not saying that men ain't led away with this stuff too because they are. But notice what, notice what he says here. Led away with diverse lusts, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what happens. These men creep in, they lead these people captive, they lead them away, and then they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of what? There it is again. Now as Janus and Jamres withstood Moses, how did they do it? They imitated him. Those magicians in Egypt withstood Moses by imitation. This is how Satan is actively resisting the truth of God. Did y'all know that? By imitation. They're going to use words like, have you been saved? Just tell them no sometime and then ask them how to do it. Watch them. Watch them fumble it around. Have you been saved? No, how do I get saved? Well, uh, they'll take six, seven verses from all over the Bible, mix it together, none of them make any. It, you, 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 they come up with a plan of salvation that is never going to justify you before God. Right. See, they use words like salvation, gospel. Yep. They use words like rapture and resurrection. And it's imitation. That's how they resist the truth. But notice what they are. They're men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Amen? Now you know how you get this skill right here? Rightly dividing? You know how you get it? Get it by studying that Bible. The skill of rightly dividing is to purge us. This Bible study right here it's for the purpose of purging us from the errors of the religious world around us to equip us for the work of going out and recovering other people out of that snare. Amen? Now, the skill is developed by comparing Scripture with Scripture and then rightly dividing things that are different from the things that are the same. You know what you do? Y'all, I mean, it's, it's, it's sad that many people handle a jigsaw puzzle with more intelligence and more care than they do the Word of God. But you know what you do when you first open a jigsaw puzzle? You dump it out on the table. What do you do? You rightly divide the border pieces from the rest of the puzzle, right? Then you might go through there and like, well, these are blue. Those are sky pieces. And you rightly divide them. These are green. These are grass pieces. Rightly divide them. Oh, this has got wood in it. That must be the building. And you rightly divide it. Then you know what you start doing? You start looking at how, 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 how all those pieces connect. 
It's like Brother Tim said that I, I said here not long ago. Guys, you, you, you not only have to know how to rightly divide, but you also have to know how to rightly combine. Once you get the scriptures rightly divided, God wants you to understand how it all works together for his will and purpose. Amen. What Corin was talking about this morning. People know that Hebrews, there's right division people in this world that know Hebrews is a doctrinal epistle for the nation of Israel in the 70th week of Daniel. But they act like they forgot all about the mystery by the time they get there. And forget that when Hebrews comes into application, millions and millions of Jews and Gentiles have been called out of the earth to meet Christ in the air. They just act like it didn't happen. Just forget all about it. <coughs> right? So how do, you, how do you rightly divide? Let's look at some things here. One of the big words in the Christian world is gospel. Right? Go, go, tell, go tell an average Christian, go tell a preacher. There's more than one gospel. Watch how they react. Watch how they react. That's, that's heresy. That's heresy. Yeah, it's heresy against the church, but it ain't heresy against the Word of God. Look here. Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel. That's how they read it. The gospel. See that word of? Guys, if you, listen, if you don't think the word of is important, then I challenge you, I've got, a, I've got a cup of strychnine and a cup of water. You see, gospel's like a cup. It's a general word. There's the contents. A jar of mayonnaise, a jar of pickles, a jar of mu uh, mustard. The contents of the jar change. Now all this is connected. It's all the word of God. That's what the King James translators did there. They took a Greek word, evangelium, and they translated it as spell. See that word spell? It means word. Angel. Evangel. Angel. You see angel in the word? Evangelist, they took that and they translated it spell. When you cast a spell on somebody, you know what you're doing? You're, in, you're casting an enchant, chant, chant. What is it? Words. Then they took the other part of it and they translated it God or good. God spell. Good spell. What is it? Good word or God's word of what? That word in and of itself is general. It doesn't define what that gospel is about. So there's a gospel. Now look here. Moreover, brethren, I declared it. I went to Baptist church. is how they quoted it. I declare unto you the gospel. That's how they quoted it. What God? The gospel which I preached unto you. And now Paul's going to tell you what he preached. How that Christ, what? Died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now how could Christ, walking around, living and breathing, be telling people that he died, was buried and rose again the third day? In fact, it's a full three years later. Y'all know how to count. What comes first, four or 16? <laughs> so Christ was preaching the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew chapter 4. And it's not until chapter 16, from that time forth, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders, and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. That means for three and a half years, he never mentioned it. Now there's times he references it, they didn't understand it, then later they understood it. Like when he says, 
destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up. But you know what it says in John 20? Not only was Christ preaching the gospel of the kingdom and doesn't mention, doesn't begin to tell his disciples about his death and resurrection until Matthew 16, but the 12 apostles are sent out in Matthew 10 to preach the kingdom. And you know what it said in John 20? As yet they understood not the scripture that he must be raised from the dead. There you go. But you, you know what religion does? They don't, they don't have any idea what we're talking about here. They just, they just take the word gospel and they just make it whatever they want to make it that day. How do I get saved? Well, sell all that you have and give to the poor. And then repent and be baptized. And then believe the gospel and then hold fast and endure to the end. Will that save me? I don't know. We'll see. Amen? And I, we're laughing having a good time. But now you understand why I get so mad. Why I'm so upset. I'm, listen, man, I have conviction about that book up there. I believe anything contrary to that book is a lie, and I hate it. Because I know the father of it. Right there is the father of truth, everything, every deviation of it. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. And I'm zealous over my father, man, and the things of my father. Jesus Christ died on a cross, shed his blood to give me every precious promise and word in that book. And I'm going to keep it. And I'm going to hold it fast. And I'm going to fight for it. Here's a gospel right here. This one cracks me up. I seen a young boy one time on YouTube say Dr. Ruckman was going to hell for saying that there was more than one gospel in the Bible, and this was his proof. The Bible calls it the everlasting gospel. See that word saying? What do you do with people? That the very passage tells you what the angel preaches, and you still miss it. I don't know what to do. This angel comes through heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto who? Them that dwell on the earth, when? For the hour of his judgment is what? That gospel is not preached until the last half of the tribulation. And it's not about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It says, fear God and give glory to him and worship him. Another angel immediately follows this angel and says, If any man take the mark and worship the beast, there's a gospel right there. Amen? You know what, Solomon? You know why it's called the everlasting gospel? This fear God? You know what Solomon said? He said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That'll fit in any dispensation. What God tell you to do right now? He told you, he told you, listen, if you fear God, you know what you've done? You have submitted to his righteousness in the gospel of Christ and trusted in him to justify you. Y'all understand what I'm talking about? Now y'all think it's okay just run around, let religious people just... Here's another gospel. This one will get me in trouble. The light of the glorious gospel of Christ. See it? Oh, that's the death, burial, and resurrection. Is it? Have you read the context? Chapter 3, chapter 4, 2 Corinthians? What Paul's talking about is the ministry of the New Testament by the Spirit of God. Changing us. Into that same image from glory to glory. You know what Paul's talking about right here? He's talking about us bearing in our body the death of Christ. That this life and glory of Christ may shine in us. You know what the glorious gospel of Christ is? It's about his image. As he now sets at the right hand of the Father. Look at it right here. Right here it is, guys. 
For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to do what? Give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God where? So where are you beholding that glory? In the face of Christ, but you're seeing it darkly through a glass. And as you behold that glory in a glass, you're being changed into that same image. And then you know what? If the world can't see it shining in you, it's because Satan's got them so blinded they can't see. That ain't, that ain't talking. That's more than talking about Jesus Christ dying for your sins. Amen? So our brethren got some problems too. Kingdom. Boy, the Pentecostals love the kingdom, don't they? Everybody wants to talk about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Look at this one. Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his what? But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come unto you. People are like, yeah, they're the same. Kingdom. That's a, the word kingdom just, ugh. They can't think straight anymore. You can't expect people to think there's more than one. It's too hard for them. You see this kingdom right here? The son of who? Whose kingdom is it? The son of man's. What does that mean? It's physical. It's flesh. Has it come or is it coming? See this one here? Whose kingdom is this? Is it flesh and blood or is it spiritual? That one's physical and can be seen. This one doesn't come with observation. They said, when shall the kingdom of God appear? He said, the kingdom of God don't come with observation. Observance. Remember when he said, the wind bloweth, and you see it, and you hear it, but you cannot tell from whence it came, so is everyone born of the Spirit. Natural man can't tell where the kingdom of God's coming from. Man, this kingdom here is coming. This one is come. Guys, listen. <laughs> you need a fifth grade education to understand this stuff. Now, what's wrong with a bunch of guys that got doctorates in front of their name that can't, don't know the difference between <coughs> Spirit of God and Son of Man? Do y'all know the difference between the Spirit of God and the Son of Man? No. Do y'all know the difference between coming and come? Then you're going to know the difference between these two kingdoms. Amen. See this kingdom of heaven right here? What do you got? What, what do they have to have to get into that kingdom? They got to have a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Meaning the scribes and Pharisees ain't getting in either. They got to have a righteousness that exceeds. You can't enter this kingdom of heaven, Christ says, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. What is that kingdom of heaven? People's like, well, it's the same as the kingdom of God. Do y'all know the difference between heaven and God? Heaven is my what? Throne. Heaven is the throne of this God. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom established on the earth. Earth is my footstool. The kingdom of heaven is a kingdom established on this earth that is submitted and under subjection to the throne of heaven. How you get it? Look, now look, here's another one. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of... My whole point is to show you that there's a need to rightly divide and very few people know how to do it. So worked up, preacher, Absolutely. I've been, every, I've, been, I've, been, I've been in churches and around Christians for 20 years of my life. 20 of the 40 years of my life, I've been serious about God in that book, and it's hard to find biblical truth among any of them. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, 
He cannot enter into the kingdom of what? God. They're the same, right? Absolutely not. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. Remember these two kingdoms back here? This is a physical kingdom coming one day. This is a spiritual kingdom. They can't enter the physical kingdom without a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. They can't get into the kingdom of God unless they're born of what? So how do you get into a spiritual kingdom? A spiritual birth. Amen? Now what's he tell them to do? Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first what? And whose righteousness? There it is. People just running around. Kingdom of God and kingdom of heavens. The same. Why? Because I'm lazy and don't want to figure it out. Can, am, am I being honest with you or is that too up front, guys? Can I be honest with you? What's a man doing worried about Greek and Hebrew and he don't even know the difference between God and heaven? I mean it, guys. It takes this kind of simplistic common sense to set people straight. Because you take somebody serious. Well, the Greek word here is theos. You know, and oh, he's so intelligent. And then after he gets done giving you all the Greek about all this stuff, he comes to the conclusion that the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are the same. And I'm showing you they can't possibly be. Right. What does Paul say about the kingdom of God? This, and even our brethren, people in right division circles, I get emails and calls, why is Paul preaching the kingdom in Acts 28? Which one's he preaching? He doesn't just preach it in Acts 28. He preaches it in Romans 14, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians 5, Ephesians 5. They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of what? God. Know you not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of who? God. The kingdom of God is not in word but in power. He preaches it all over. Look here. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy where? So where's the kingdom of God at? It's in the Holy Ghost, isn't it? Is that where the kingdom of God is? <laughs> Can you find it? What is it? How do, you, how, how do you know it? Well, it's, it's not a bunch of people going around going, I don't eat pork like the Muslims. Or I don't eat pork like the Jews. Or I go to church on Sabbath day. The kingdom of God is not in meat and drink. It's in its righteousness, peace, and joy. Where? In the Holy Ghost. You know what those three things are there? They're the first three fruits of the Spirit of God mentioned by Paul in Galatians 5. Love. Joy, peace. Notice that righteousness is defined for you in Galatians when the first fruit of the Spirit is love. You know what righteousness is? It's faith working by love. Amen. Too much Bible this morning? Now, now here, here we're about ready to throw you for a loop now. <laughs> Because look here, kingdom of Christ and of God. <laughs> See there? Why does Paul say that? Because these two kingdoms that we've been talking about, in God's purpose, they are to become one kingdom. The kingdom of the Son of Man and the kingdom of God are to be a unified kingdom. Amen? Amen? In the fullness of times. It's what the throne of David is all about. Whose throne? Heaven is whose throne? God's. Swear not by heaven, for it is his throne. 
neither by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Jerusalem is the connection in all of it. Amen. Look at the Davidic promise. What did God promise David? Of the fruit of thy what? Will I set upon what? How's God going to set? You know what that means? God is going to set on David's throne one day through somebody that comes out of his loins. You know what that means? That means this spirit of God right here is sitting upon David's throne through this son of man right here. See it? What had already come, guys? The kingdom of God. Where was it? It was in Christ. Y'all understanding this? The two kingdoms are going to become one one day. Revelation eleven fifteen. 15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. That's Exodus 15, 18. Go read it. Whose throne is in New Jerusalem? The throne of who? And of who? <laughs> Joint throne. You getting this? I ain't going to keep you much longer, guys. Y'all understand the need to rightly divide? People just running around, kingdom, kingdom, don't know. They're going to use the words. Here's a, here's a big one right here, guys. You see this one? Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since when? What's he talking about? These times of restitution is when Christ returns from heaven. That's what's been spoken since the world began. But guess what? He's up there right now. For 2,000 years he's been up there. Meaning the times of restitution haven't come. And the times of restitution that begin at the second coming is something that's been spoken since the world began. But what about today? The preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began but now is made manifest. And, see that word and? And by the scriptures of the prophets. Got it? This is my litmus test with people. If I want to know how serious you are about learning that book, it's where I take you. And if, if it don't jump off at the page to you that God said something since the world began and kept something secret since the world began, and if you try to get, if you try to weasel your way out of that so that you can hold to some denominational creed, run along. You got some growing up to do. If you don't know the difference between something spoken and something kept secret, there's something operating in your mind that you better go home and get on your face and worry about it. Amen? If there's something in your mind that will not allow you to see the difference of these two things, that would scare me. Problem is, they, they, don't, they can't see it, therefore they don't have any reason to be scared. Amen. But they're different. What is this mystery that we're talking about? Well, Paul says that he was made a minister. This was Paul's ministry to us. According to the dispensation of God given to me for who? So God dispensed something to Paul for the sake of ministering it to us. Paul's a minister. According to the dispensation of God given to him for you to fulfill the word of God. Meaning without this dispensation and ministry of Paul, you wouldn't have a complete Bible. Meaning you cannot find Paul's information anywhere else in the Bible. Why? It had been kept secret since the world began. What was dispensed to Paul? The mystery. 
which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. What is God making known to these saints? He's making known the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. What is it? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. That's what God is making known at this present time. Notice who it concerns and who it's among. See that Gentile there? Let's see what the Bible says about the Gentiles. Listen, man, this is what I love about this Bible. You want to know, who, you want to know about Jesus Christ? Let's learn about him. You want to learn about him? You know who he was? He was a minister of the circumcision. You're out. That's who he was. For what? The truth of God to confirm the promises made unto who? You know what you were? You were an alien and a stranger to that stuff. And, now watch, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is what? Well, it ain't it. This right here wasn't written. This is the Gentiles according to what was written, according to prophecy. When are they going to glorify God? When God shows mercy to Israel. And Paul gives you three quotes from the Old Testament about it. Go back and read them. They're all about the restored Israel and the millennial kingdom and the Gentiles. Glorifying God for his mercy. God said in Ezekiel, all the heathen shall know that I have sanctified Israel when I dwell in the midst of her. But there's, there's riches among the Gentiles right now according to this mystery. Right? Here, we all know this passage. Syrophoenician woman came to him. What did Christ say? I am not sent. But unto the lost sheep of the house of who? Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take children's bread. This one right here, Israel. It is not meat to take children's bread and cast it to the dogs. <laughs> In Luke, he actually says, Let the children first be filled. Because that's the order of operation in prophecy. Israel first, then the Gentiles. I say then, have they, Israel, stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto who? For to provoke them to jealousy. See this stuff about Gentiles in there? Christians are just so used to having a Bible now, they just think it's always been like that. No. 2,500 years ago, your ancestors were eating kids and fornicating and offering sacrifices to devils and everything else. What turned Gentile history around was there was a man named Saul of Tarsus that was sent. Jesus Christ was sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Paul was sent to the heathen. How did salvation come unto the Gentiles? Through what? Their fall. Well, that ain't according to prophecy, as it is written. Right there's prophecy. And the Gentiles shall come to thy what? Light and kings to the brightness of thy... Not their fall. You with me? See the difference between mystery and prophecy? Even the Gentiles. You have Israel as it is written. You have Gentiles as it is written. Well, today you got Israel according to the mystery and Gentiles according to the mystery. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. The blindness in part, see that word is happened, that means present, a present state in accordance to something that's already come to pass. 
Blindness in part is happened to Israel. It's part of your history. Until, it's not permanent, until the fullness of who comes in? Gentiles. And so all Israel shall be saved as what? Right there you have Israel according to the mystery and Israel according to prophecy. Amen? Right now there's a fullness of the Gentiles being called out by God to put, notice Israel's not completely blind, they're blind in what? And God is calling out from among the Gentiles this fullness to put with this part of Israel to make up the body of Christ. And all Israel will be saved as it is written. And then guess what happens? The Gentiles that are still here are going to glorify God and come to the brightness of Israel's rising. Amen. Here, here's some more. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to shut up, guys. Here, give me about five minutes here. Because the rest of these are just basic. See that verse on baptism? How many are there? One, a two, <laughs> a what? Three. Water, Holy Ghost, fire. You know what it, you know, you know, you know why that every time you hear the word baptism, that's what you think? Because religion taught you that, not the Bible. There's three of them in there. Why don't this one come to mind? When Paul talks about people being baptized for the dead, why do you think that he's saying there were people being baptized in water for dead people? Religion taught you to think like that. Not a Bible. There's three baptisms right there. Look at Hebrews 6 2. Doctrine of what? One what? Good luck with that book. There's three, there's a plural, and then Paul says there's one baptism. You know why he says that? Because he's talking about the unity of the Spirit of God. There's only one baptism that gets you into the body of Christ. Amen? Amen? That's the one he tells you to endeavor to keep, not be fighting over sprinkling and immersion. Right there, John the Baptist, what was he sent to do? Sent me to baptize. What were the 12 sent out to do? What was Paul sent to do? Not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Amen? There's, there's where 90% of Christians are getting their marching orders today. Amen? See that day is at hand right there? Then Paul turns around and says, let no, man let no man deceive you by any means as that the day of Christ is what? Well, then obviously these are two different days, aren't they? Well, Paul don't know what he's doing either, and we'll just go to the house. Well, what day is at hand here? The day of what? Our salvation. This day of Christ is not the day of our salvation. It's the day he rises to judge the world. Meaning your salvation, you know what day is getting closer and closer for you? Salvation right there. That's the day that's getting nearer. This one right here is being withheld. Now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed when? The Antichrist. 1 John 2, 18, little children, it is the last what? And as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. And we say, John and Paul are writing to do different group of people in two different time periods. People say, well, it's the greatest heresy I ever heard. Tell me they're not. Are you living in the time that the Antichrist is going to be revealed? Then John cannot doctrinally apply to you.
Last one. I get this one all the time. You talk, I, talk, I talk about functional sanctification. And what I mean by that is God said build an altar. And that altar was set apart by God to receive sacrifices. And if a priest never went up there and offered a sacrifice on it, that thing never functioned in the purpose for which it was set apart. And people just, I, I, I talk about sanctification and people, people will send me emails, I'm already sanctified in Christ. People like that, before they come at somebody like me, they better go home, read their Bible, make sure they know what they're talking about. See that, sanctified in Christ? What about this one here? The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. You going to use that one the same way the people use this one? Because all they, all they mean is that I'm already saved. That's all, that's all, they think every word like this just means getting saved. Redemption, remission, propitiation, adoption, you know, just all of it just means getting saved. It means me not going to hell. Look what the Bible says about being sanctified. Do you know an unbelieving husband is sanctified in his home by the wife that believes? Do you know the children of that marriage are holy by that believing spouse? People say, like, I don't understand it. Of course you don't. Is the kids better off in the house with two unbelieving parents or with one believing? Husband, an unbelieving husband, he's, listen, he's in a better, he's in a more set apart, holy home by the believing wife than he would be with an unbelieving wife. The point Paul's making is you women don't use that as an excuse to leave your husbands because he might be one. Amen? Right there's a sanctification that comes from purging yourself. Right there's a sanctification that comes from abstaining from fornication and knowing how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. There's a sanctification that comes from from Christ cleansing you and washing you in the book. There's a sanctification right there. The very God of peace sanctify you what? Holy. And in that context, it's body, soul, spirit. Remember when Paul said, cleanse yourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit? Right there, I was going to talk about the difference between functional death and positional death. Right there, you've already been baptized into his death. But right here, Paul still saw an active law in his flesh that brought him, he that is dead is what? Freed from sin. Then why is Paul saying he's a captive to it here? Because that one's positional, this one's functional. And in Romans chapter 8, Paul tells you how to be freed from that law of sin through walking after the Spirit, and if you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of the body, what do you do? Then we talk about positional and functional life and death, and people think we're crazy. What I want y'all to get, man, y'all understand the importance of studying that book and taking it serious. There are things in there that are different. This here is different from this down here. Right? Dying, being baptized into the death of Christ, and being freed from the dominion of sin by God putting you under grace. That's one way you're freed from sin, is that you're under grace. Another way God frees you from sin is by the life of the Spirit that He's given you right here. When Paul says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death, he ain't talking about this freedom here. He's already been freed from the legal condemnation of sin. And he's now under grace. The freedom he's talking about in Romans 8, being freed from the law of sin and death, he's talking about freedom from this active law that wars against his mind and brings him into captivity. That's what he's talking about. And so, understand, guys, there are men in this world running around. I'll have somebody, I had a guy message me last week and be like, oh, you, you, this is a universalist. 
God, I guess I upset him with my message on 1 Corinthians. I got to tell you this story, and I promise I'll shut up. I guess my message on 1 Corinthians either pricked him or cut him or upset him or something because he sent me a message, told me I was a, a self-righteous, angry individual and that I was a sick, sick, sick man. This kind of stuff I get from people, guys. And I just wrote him back. This is a guy who thinks all men are saved. And I wrote him back and I said, I said, telling a man that weeps on a daily basis and loves Jesus Christ for dying for his sins, a self-righteous man while telling people they reject him, that they're saved anyway, is too ignorant for words. It's too ignorant for words. Amen? Amen. I'll, get, I'll get jumped all onto for this message. Don't worry, I, don't, I don't worry about it, neither should you. Don't be ashamed. Amen? We are to partake in the afflictions of standing for this truth. You know why people, you know why people, listen, they have no problem when you preach on positional death to sin, but start preaching on functional freedom for sin. Oh, they don't want to deal. They don't want it. Why? They don't want to be freed from it functionally. They want to function in sin and death and just not go to hell for it when it's over. That's why they are the way they are. I can discern a lot about a man's heart. Amen. All right. Uh, Brother Tim, you want to close out in prayer, brother?